start recording here we go so uh we actually have kind of a short text tonight but nevertheless i think that you will see it is an important text and a potentially confusing text we're in romans 11 25 through 36 actually before i read it let's review especially because we have a couple of people who are joining us for the first time tonight what is Romans chapter one through eight, all about in one sentence. Chapter what? Uh, the first, the first part of Romans one through eight, the major part of Romans. Where does justification come from? Hold on, I'm, I'm going to slip over into the corner here and cry for a few moments, and then I will come back. Faith? Yes, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We were muted again. I didn't, <laughs> want, to, I, I didn't want to see you cry. <laughs> yeah, but I, that, would, that would mask the dark circles under my eyes. Um, yes, it's about justification by faith. It's available for Jew and Gentile alike. The law of Moses is not the basis of justification, never has been, never will be. It was always justification by faith. Abraham found that. All of God's faithful people found that. And it's the same thing true uh, in the church today. In Christ, we are justified as a gift of God, the, the right standing before him through our faith. So, I'm sorry, Robin, go ahead. Oh, never mind. I'm oh, sorry. John. Oh, oh, okay. Well, no, you're all right. I'm going to mute you for next time. Okay. Um, so Romans 9 introduces this problem that if that's the case, well, what about Israel? Um, does that mean that many people from the nation of Israel are actually lost because they don't have faith in Jesus? This is God's own covenant people, you know, his own, his own people from Old Testament days, are they lost? And Paul's answer is, sadly, yes, that is what that means that um, Israel finds itself in a situation where they have no faith in Jesus. And so, at least for now, um, the majority of the nation finds itself excluded from God's kingdom. And that's not something Paul's happy about or ambivalent about. He's torn up about that fact, as he says at the beginning of both chapter 9 and chapter 10, and tries to deal with that reality with his, uh, with his Jewish readers and Gentile readers. So chapter 11 continues that thought, and hopefully you remember from Sunday morning, we talked about how God was sort of using this period of time when uh, the Gentiles are being added to God's kingdom and they're experiencing the blessings of God um, as a, an opportunity to make Israel jealous. Um, you know, they're going to see, wait a minute, that's the, the good stuff that we used to have. We used to enjoy God's favor, God's blessings. And now they're getting it, and we don't have it. And so Paul says in chapter 11, God is using this time to make his people jealous, to win them back. So even in their rejection, he has got a gracious plan for their return. And then he uses that great illustration. Let's see if you remember what it was. Um, it would be um, citrus owners would really understand the illustration that Paul uses in chapter 11. Do you remember what it is? Owners of citrus groves would really understand it. concept of a tree and grafting in those which are not originally there. Fantastic. The idea of a graft. So in the ancient world, just like today, you can take a rootstock and you can trim off a branch or you can actually trim off the whole sapling and graft into its place a, a branch from a different tree. And it will, that graft will take and oftentimes it will produce even better results. So Paul takes that image and says, uh, God is the root, and many among the Jews were broken off because of their unbelief, and Gentiles were grafted into their place. But they better not feel all uppity and all you know, proud of themselves because God can do the same thing and break them back out and put the Jews back in if he wanted to. Um, Actually, it would be easier for God to do that because the Jewish people are, are naturally part of the tree, whereas the Gentiles who were grafted in are like wild olive trees. So, um, 
So they, they better be thankful for what they've got is, is the point. Hey, Stephen, how are you? Um, so with all of that review under our belts now, let's go ahead and read the short section that we want to talk about tonight. Uh, yes, Carol. Thank you. I just wanted to comment on what a perfect imagery this is for uh, Romans, Italy, olives, all of that, uh, and, and the surrounding countries understood. When an olive tree had quit its most prolific uh, harvest and growing, it was trimmed back and uh, other was grafted to it. And that really illustrates to them about the next section about the uh, the roots were, st were the, where the strength was, not the branches that were brought into it. So uh, I think they really got it. It wasn't like something they had to Google or look up because they lived with that <laughs> right that, all around them. That's an excellent point. They would be very familiar with that illustration. That, that's a great point. All right, uh, so Romans 11, 25 through 36. Here we go. This is tonight's lesson. Whoops, I'm going to skip that. Uh, starting verse 25. I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, and he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience. So these also now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. Oh, the depths and the of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? who has given to him that it might be paid back to him again. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and amen. Okay, so um, notice in verse 26, the first slide that we read tonight. What does verse 26 say? And this is the crucial point that we'll spend the whole night talking about. Don't everybody speak up at once. All of Israel will be saved. Good, Danny. That's exactly right. He says uh, very, very plainly, all Israel will be saved. Okay. So if we just took that statement for itself and didn't talk about anything beyond verse 26, what would that suggest is God's plan for Israel? Yeah, I'll do a little dance while you're thinking about it. <laughs> no matter what they'll do, they'll be saved. Good. That sounded an awful lot like Taryn's voice. Yes, good to have you. Um, Charles' son Taryn is with us tonight. Jeff has gone back home, but he's been replaced. So I won't say whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'll let the brothers fight over that. But anyway, um, that, that's right. It, it sounds an awful lot like every single Jewish person, every person from the descendants of Abraham is going to automatically be saved. Anybody else see that verse differently just for itself? Go ahead, Stephen. Stephen, you're muted still. Okay, now, as Paul says that not everybody that comes from Israel is an Israelite. So those are... Uh, the Jew, the Jew that killed Jesus, the one that came to save him, the, the people that rejected him, his own rejected him. Uh, he said, he said that they were children of the devil. And 
And he said, no, we're children of Abraham. I said, yeah, so you will be doing Abraham's work if you'll be his children. So uh, he's speaking about the, the word I'm trying to learn to how, how to spell this word, remnant, remnant. I believe from Israel, those who believe and receive Jesus will be safe. Good. And grafted right, so... to the vine through faith. So, so yeah, all, all, all that believe and receive the Son of God will, uh, according to Abraham's faith, they will be justified through faith as Good. Abraham was. Good. So, so speaking so about, I believe. Stephen believe. Is, is rightly attempting to view that passage in its context, because if we just look at the verse all by itself, without considering the context at all, we might be left with the idea that all the Jews are automatically going to be saved. And actually, that is a very, very popular doctrine today. Um, it's the basis of the political movement that's called Zionism. <clears throat> I don't know if you know about what, what that teaches or not, but uh, basically, well, let me take this off again. The idea of Zionism is that the Jews need to have a place in the promised land, the, the land of Palestine once again, and that God is not finished with the promises that he made to Abraham. So political Israel has a place in God's, in God's kingdom, in God's plan going forward. Um, and that is the basis of U.S. support of the nation of Israel even today. But in a doctrinal sense, there are many people who believe that from this verse, God will automatically save all of the Jews. And doctrinally, that it ties into a lot of end times sort of predictions kind of thing. So this is, I just pulled two quotes. I could have pulled a zillion of these quotes, but I didn't want to bore you with them. Uh, this is from uh, LaHaye and Jenkins' book. This, these, these are the two authors that wrote the whole Left Behind series, of uh, both the books and the movies. Uh, I call the regathering of five million Jews back to the Holy Land and they're becoming a nation, the infallible sign of the approach of the end times. Again, I don't want to, I don't want to wear you out with this, but the, the Jewish nation today has a place in the doctrine of last things for premillennials. Um, then uh, just one more. Uh, this is from anybody. Did anybody ever read Hal Lindsey's late great planet earth? He's kind of previous to my generation. A lot of those in my parents age group have read this book. Not, not so popular anymore, but it, it was foundational for this premillennial understanding of God's uh, end time plans. Anyway, he says, as Armageddon begins with the invasion of Israel by the Arabs and the Russian Confederacy and their consequent swift destruction, the greatest period of Jewish conversion uh, to the true Messiah will begin. The destruction of the great Russian invading force will have a supernatural element to it, which will cause great numbers of the Jews to see the hand of the Lord. So, Again, premillennialists believe that at right before the very end of all things, that um, God is going to show up during Armageddon in a very special way, and all of the Jews are going to realize that Jesus Christ really is the Messiah, the Son of God. And when that happens, they will all be saved. And Romans chapter 11 is supposed to be the verse that, that proves because it comes right out there. Let me put it back up on the screen once again. Uh, Romans 11 verse 26 says, all Israel will be saved. So what do you think about that so far? Stephen already began to answer this, but let me ask the rest of you as well. Hold on, hold on. Hey everybody, don't forget to meet yourselves. Um, what, uh, what do you suppose the greater context of Romans and the scriptures would suggest about that interpretation of verse 26. I mean, I kind of like to let the Bible interpret itself. And so if verse 26 standing on its own seems to suggest something that's out of, out of sync with the rest of the book of Romans and out of sync of the rest of the Bible, then we just need to look at it in a different light. But what, what does the rest of Romans and the Bible suggest? Will all the Jews be saved? No, actually, as Stephen already pointed out, we've spent the better part of the last three or four weeks talking about how God spent a lot of the history with the Jewish people being uh, upset and, and impatient with them and condemning so many of them. 
So let me put a slide up that we'll work our way through here. Um, skip the first point for a moment. Go back to Romans 10 and look at verses 27 through 29. Stephen, I think you even cited this passage a minute ago. This is Romans 10, verses 27 through 29. You know, it would really help if I would quote the correct verse, wouldn't it? Um, sorry, Romans 9, verses 27 through 29. Israel cries out concerning, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the what that will be saved. Does anybody see that word? Remnant. The remnant. Thank you, Gigi. It is the remnant that will be saved. For the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. In fact, the next verse, verse 29 Isaiah said, unless the Lord had left a posterity to us, we would have become like Sodom and Gomorrah. And you know, there was nothing left of Sodom and Gomorrah. So it's only because God spared a remnant that any of the Jewish people were saved. For most of their history, he was very disappointed in them and condemned them. Um, look again at a verse that we looked at last week. This is Romans 11 and verse 5. In the same way, there has come to be at the present time a a remnant according to God's gracious purpose, God's gracious choice. So I'm just pulling out a couple of verses. Paul in the book of Romans repeatedly has said that it is the faithful remnant among Israel that will be saved. Not all of the descendants of Abraham will be saved at all. Um, and that we made uh, a lot of that very powerful point last week. But that certainly should inform the way we look at verse 26 tonight. Um, let me just ask you a, almost a silly little question, but if Romans 11 and verse 26 really does mean that all Israel will be saved, who does that have to include? All the bad people. Yes, not only all the bad people, but let's pick out a really specific bad person. Uh, the, uh, Judas Iscariot? Judas, that's right. And do you remember in uh, John 17 what Jesus called Judas? The son of the perdition? Yeah, the son of perdition, which is a fancy word for destruction. In other words, Judas is doomed to eternal separation from God. He's going to be tormented. He's... He is not going to be saved. He's going to be lost eternally. Uh, in fact, Jesus says it would have been better had that man not even been born. So I, I realize that that's just one individual, but a doctrine's a doctrine. If the doctrine says that all of Israel will automatically be saved, and yet we've got other scriptures talking about Judas being lost eternally, then something's wrong with one of those two doctrines. And I, I would say that Romans 11.26 is a little bit more limited, and Paul means it in a more limited sense than just the blanket statement, all Israel will automatically be saved. Go ahead, Stephen. My favorite verses of Scripture is from John 1.12. Uh, he came to his own. His own received them not. Yes. Received them. He gave them power to become children of God. So this is a remnant. I'm sorry if I don't say the word right. I'm, I'm no, you're saying it right. Word. So they're chosen people from the midst of uh, the Jew, uh, people that received them and believed them and obeyed them and followed them. Yeah, but, you know, we have those in the midst of them as Judas and the Pharisees, the religious, that re literally rejected the Lord, actually crucified them. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I believe salvation is for uh, the Jew, for everyone that believe in Jesus Christ. Good. Uh, very good. Um, and that and actually, let's pause for a moment and, and make that point a little bit more strongly, because I do think that is the correct answer that we're driving at, Stephen, definitely, is when Paul says, and so all Israel will be saved, looking at that in its context, what would be a better way to put that? I'm not trying to rewrite scripture, by the way. I'm just trying to get us to understand it in its context. 
And I think the idea is that all Israel will be saved in the way that Paul has been describing throughout this letter. And what is that way? What we started out with tonight. It's justification by faith. So, Faith, faith yeah. in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ. That's exactly right. So all Israel will be saved in the same manner that is being described throughout this letter, by their faith in Jesus. So that means individually, every Jewish person, just like every Gentile person, has to make a choice whether or not to serve Jesus. So I, I hope that that's very clear. And um, just in case you ever run across that, that doctrine or you, you watch it on a late night TV infomercial where they're asking you to send money to Israel because uh, the, you know, Zionism needs to be supported. You'll know where that comes from, what kind of the theological underpinning of that notion really is. And it's really just not a, a scriptural concept at all. Um, John, yeah, John can, I insert, can I insert something here? Oh, please, please go right ahead. Uh, then what it would mean if you took that literally, which my mother did, and I fought over that with, for her for years, is that you would, they would go back and say, all the descendants of Abraham would be saved right rather than being saved through christ they would be saved through their seed in abraham and that's obviously not what the gospel teaches right in fact if you go back to romans 9 and verse 7 paul made that point very strongly where he said they're not all children because they're abraham's descendants and he you know just because you can trace your lineage back to abraham doesn't actually mean that you're part of abraham's uh, promised descendancy, promised children, that there is the promise, there is the, the, the grace, the choice that's involved. Through Isaac, your descendants will be named. So it's not all the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise who are regarded as descendants. So, um, yeah. Um, Stephen, go ahead. I see your hand. Uh, and you have told about this. You have, you have teach about this. And when he said, in your seed, mm -hmm. all the nations will be blessed, he was speaking about not many seeds as all his children born from his loins, but the seed speaking specifically of Christ, of, yes. of Jesus Christ. So That's it's to faith in Christ. It's to faith in Christ. Very, very, very good. Excellent point. Anybody else? All right, so here's a very positive point that I'd like everybody to take away from. And if you've slept through the whole class so far, don't worry because there's still an opportunity to gain something right here. This is the positive point that we want to leave with tonight, which is that now in the gospel age, even the notion, even the word Israel comes to have a different meaning. It, it comes to mean all of those who are a part of God's promise from the very beginning, those who accept Jesus of both Jews and Gentiles. In other words, we sort of begin to speak of this notion of spiritual Israel. And um, I'd like you to please get out your Bible and turn over to the book of Galatians, because I think Paul's write-up in Galatians makes this even more plain. Uh, you may have heard at times that Galatians is like the abbreviated or the baby Romans, and, and it is. They parallel each other quite closely. It's just that Galatians is much shorter than the book of Romans. But Galatians definitely brings out this point. Uh, so for example, if you look at Galatians chapter three and look at verses six through nine, even so Abraham believed God. And it was reckoned to him as righteousness. You may remember we talked about this in the book of Romans a lot. Therefore, this is Galatians 3, 7, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying all the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Look at chapter 3 and verses 23 through 29. This is still in Galatians 3, verses 23 through 29. Before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. 
But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, here's the key part, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. You get that in verse 29? If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's descendants. So in a, in a real manner of speaking, it is true that all Israel will be saved. But who is Israel? In the gospel age, it is those who have faith in Jesus Christ. They are spiritual Israel. Look at one more passage. Look at Galatians 6 and verses 15 and 16, where Paul is closing out the letter and he says, neither is circumcision anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. And the idea there is on, on the church, right? It's on everybody who's serving God. And he calls that the Israel of God in that place. So, um, uh, Philippians 3.3 3 teaches the same basic point, but I think that's, I think it's probably good enough to make the point. Is that, is that clear? Uh, do, you, do you understand how it is reasonable to call the church the Israel of God? Does that make sense? Perhaps you do not agree with that, and you'd like to discuss that further. No, everybody likes it so far. All right, Stephen, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> um, as I see, and I have been able to understand a little bit, salvation has always, from the beginning, uh, is being through faith. Remember, God is a spirit, and nobody I've ever seen God, uh, but they believe the word that was spoken by the anointed man of God. They obeyed that word, and that brought ju justification by faith. Mm -hmm. They were they, they was called righteous, not so much so that there is a book specifically written about these people. It's called uh, the it, it, some people call it the the uh, the hall of faith. Mentions yes. Daniel, Hebrews mentions, 11, right? He mentions uh, Gideon, people that believed the Spirit of God and obey it, and God justified them through faith. So, uh, so this is this is a, a remnant, and and please bear with me. I will learn to say that word one day. You're getting soon, close soon. <laughs> yes. So, uh, is is is. It's shout, shout like faith to, to hear the word of God, to trust the word of God, to obey the word of God brings justification by faith. So and, that's, that's and, the, and that's the person, Israel of God. And makes that's a person the Israel, the Israel of God. That's exactly right. Yes. That's, that's very good. Very good. Um, you, you know, it is kind of fascinating how sometimes uh, to go off on another political tangent, people will use... Romans chapter 11 and Matthew chapter 23 and a couple of other places to say, oh, God has rejected the Jews and to, in, in such a way to justify uh, the Holocaust or abuse of the Jews or whatever. And I think that you can very clearly see that that's not been Paul's point throughout these three chapters. It is true that all of those who refuse to have faith in Jesus will be rejected eternally. But it's not that God has rejected his people. He says that over and over again. Uh, do you remember from last week what Paul's first example of his proof that God has not rejected Israel? Do you remember Paul's first proof of that? Gigi says himself. And I think she used American Sign Language to get it out, too. That was, that was pretty good. Uh, Paul himself is a Pharisee of the tribe of Israel, of, the, of Benjamin. And he was saved. So obviously, God has not rejected Israel. God did not kick Israel out of the palace gates and shut the, the gate and say, "You none of you can ever come back in. What he did is say that the, the blessings are here. The kingdom has arrived. 
and you can come in like everybody else through belief in Jesus. So the Israel of God today is bigger than just the physical descendants of Abraham. It is the spiritual descendants of Abraham. It's those who have faith in Jesus, just like Abraham had. So by all means, evangelize your Jewish neighbors and share with them the same message of the gospel. Um, so that's, that's the meaning of Romans eleven twenty six. 26. That's how all Israel will be saved is through Jesus, the same way he's been talking about throughout the whole book. Stephen, go ahead. Um, in Jesus. Okay, somebody will say, but how can be in Jesus? And they don't dare ask you. Jesus was nowhere around. And, but he was faith in the word. In the beginning uh, was the word. The word, the word was with God and the word was God. And everything was created by him. And nothing without him was created. Jesus, uh, in the beginning, was not named Jesus. He was the word of God. He's the same person, but he just was not called Jesus. He's the one slain from the foundation. The one uh, that God decided and predestined to, to give as a ransom for humanity. As, as the, uh, the right, uh, the right, uh, okay. So, as they heard the word they was actually hearing jesus they, they was hearing the word but his name was was not jesus then it was the word mm -hmm. and he was given jesus has a meaning of savior and salvation and that's the only name given to men by whom we could be saved we are in a new covenant but he's been the same god all along good it's, it's been the same promise all along and it was the, the bible calls the law the uh, teacher that teaches mm -hmm. you and guides you to the direction that you're supposed to go. But he was always pointed to Jesus. Always Good. pointing to the Son of God. Yep. And remember, Jesus is the end of the law, as we talked about here recently. Very good. Um, all right. Well, let's... Don, we're getting close to our... Oh, no, no. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Charles. You, you no. next. I just want to comment on the truth of uh, salvation is through Jesus. When we read that verse... 26, all Israel will be saved. This is the word delivered. And look at that interesting closeness it is. All Israel will be delivered as it is written. And then the quote, the deliverer will come out of Zion. And we, we plainly understand that's Christ. Indeed. So all Israel will be saved by Christ. Very good. Absolutely. I Amen a hundred times to that. Very good. Anybody else? All right. So I just want to review again the last three or four verses here because this brings the whole section to a close. And you can see it's, it's kind of a, a, a doxology here where Paul just kind of brings his point to a, a spot where he just has to burst forth in praise about the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. You know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have come up with this. This is not a plan of salvation of human origin. It is of divine origin. It has to be. It's, it's so beautiful. It's so perfect. Um, we can see God's hand throughout history. His judgments are unsearchable. His ways are unfathomable. Um, the idea of that is that you can't get to the bottom of it. Uh, a fathom is like the idea of uh, your boat is in one fathom, six feet of water. But if you are in the midst of the ocean, you can put out your anchor and the anchor will never touch bottom. There's, there's just no bottom to it at all. That's unfathomable. That's what his ways are like. Um, God just uh, can't, is, is above humanity. And that's something that causes us to burst forth in praise. Uh, for from him and through him and to him are all things. The whole plan of salvation uh, start, middle, and finish is of God, and it's simply our job as creation to cooperate with it, to find our place in it, and to enjoy those blessings that God wants to provide. Once we leave chapter 11 tonight, we get into the last section of the book, starting in Romans 12. So if you want to look forward at Romans 12, 1 through 13 for Sunday morning, I would heartily encourage you to do that so that you can intelligently contribute to class. But the practical section of the book starts. And that's going to take us through all the way to the end of the book. Um, and, and so everything that we've studied thus far 
is really just to get us to the point where now we can make some of those applications. Um, so that's going to be an exciting look at all the practical stuff. And we're not in any great hurry, so we have plenty of time to spend uh, two, se two sessions on each of these chapters uh, and not feel like we're going to run up against the end of the quarter. So we're in a good spot, and I'm excited, and I hope that you are too. Stephen. The beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. All things was made by Him, and without Him, nothing that had been made was made. That Word became flesh, and we beheld His glory. The Bible calls the Son of God the glory of God. Uh, and uh, and he, we, saw, we beheld His glory as the Son, the only begotten of the Father. So, God through the word, I mean, the Godhead had been all along involved. Let us create man according to our image. Uh, and he, they went to the Tower of Babel. Let's confound, let's plural. So the Godhead had been always working unto our salvation on behalf of, uh, of us. And um, yeah, so that's the, the main idea that I get from it. Yeah. That. Yeah, good. Jesus. He's all about Jesus. He's always been about it. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to go wrong with that statement. It's all about Jesus. That's very good. Um, anybody else? Well, we're ending three minutes early tonight, but that's okay. It was a very short section, and we are perfectly poised to launch into the practical application section. So I will hush my talking tonight. Um, I'm going to hit stop on the record uh, if there's